Good afternoon, everybody. It's time for another episode of Networking. My name is Bruce Hartpence, a faculty member here at the Networking, Security, and Systems Administration Department at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and I will be your host. Today we're going to talk about the Internet Protocol. All right, as you may know, these podcasts come from a pair of books, The Packet Guide to Core Network Protocols and The Packet Guide to Routing and Switching. These are books that I wrote for O'Reilly Publishing. Right now, this is Chapter 3 in the first book, and what I decided to do was break it up into uh, two different podcasts because there's a lot to the Internet Protocol. All right, so if you were with me on the Ethernet podcast, you remember that MAC addresses have two parts, a vendor ID and a host-specific portion, but they don't carry any information regarding location. So we can't use them to help us find a host on the Internet. Uh, And in fact, Ethernet addresses, MAC addresses, physical addresses, whatever you want to call them, uh, don't live beyond a router interface. So we don't ever know the MAC address of a node that's not on our network. So to communicate on the Internet, we need some other kind of addressing to help us out. Now when we connect networks together, such as Ethernet or older stuff like Token Ring or FDEI, we're really creating an Internet or doing Internet working. And this is where the third layer of the TCP IP model gets its name. Now, the device that does this for us is a router, also operating at layer 3. Routers are also known by the name default gateway, which is what every host uses to connect to another network. And just as a reminder, layer 2 frames don't live beyond their local area network, which means that they're destroyed, and then another frame is created on the opposite side of the router. Earlier I said that we needed a little help uh, when getting in between systems, and that help comes in the form of IP. IP, or the Internet Protocol, provides that architecture for a seamless connection between systems. Built into the IP protocol is the addressing that we use to get between systems and the set of rules that everybody obeys to make all this happen. Now a lot of the work done on a local area network is done by that local area network protocol, so we get a lot of help from Ethernet. But IP really steps in to help us out when going in between systems. Now one thing I'll add is that IP packets act independently of each other. That means that an IP packet has everything it needs to get from source to destination all by itself. We say that IP delivery or IP networking is seamless and that means that everybody follows the same set of rules and that the operation is largely invisible to end users. But IP delivery is also unreliable or what we call best effort which means that you sort of cast your packets off into the void hoping that they get there. There's no priority handling or quality of service that we do normally uh, for IP packets. Now fragmentation is a process that we can use when we have large files and we need to get them across an IP network. Now this is mostly because of the local area network protocol and that means that we just have to chop up large chunks of data and then figure out a way to put those all together. It's a little complicated, it's not bad, but I'll show you how to do that in the next podcast. What you're seeing in front of you is probably the most common diagram that we have for an IP uh, packet. The way that you read this particular diagram is you start in the upper left, read across the top row, then go back to the left and read across the second row and so on and so forth. Things to remember here is that these are fields inside the packet. and We're going to go over each one of the fields, uh, so don't panic. But before we do that, I want to show you something else that makes life a little easier. Ah, here we go. This is an actual IP packet uh, caught via Wireshark. The thing that I like about packets, and for those of you who know me, I really like looking at packets, is that they show you exactly what's going on in the network, and it's sometimes much easier to understand than diagrams or reading through the RFCs. Now what we can get from this is that in the top part, you see the actual fields represented, and Wireshark does a nice job of explaining what the values are. In the bottom part, we see the hexadecimal representation of the data. Now, that's the highlighted portion, and what you can get from this is that IP packets have a header length of 20 bytes. And IP version 4 packets will always begin, well, almost always begin, with 
the hexadecimal values of 4 5. That is IP version 4, and 5 is 5 4 byte words. So 5 times 4 equals 20 bytes. Now you can refer back to this as we go because we're going to take a look at each one of the fields. All right, so here we have the first couple of fields. The version is pretty straightforward. It'll be 4 for IP version 4, and that'll only change when we start looking at IP version 6 packets. The header length, almost always going to be a 5 because this is the number of 4 byte words, so unless you've got options going, that won't change. The type of service is almost always going to be 0, and that's because most IP packets don't have priority handling. Uh, and even if they did, we don't actually use the type of service values specified in the RFC. We actually use diff serve code points these days. Uh, but that's a discussion for another day. But these will almost always be zero as they are in our example packet. Now the length field is the actual length of the entire datagram and for our example that was 60 bytes. Our next three fields are grouped together for a reason. Every IP packet has a unique identifier. And this is what we use also to collect fragments together. Now, our particular packet example was not fragmented, but if it had, then all of the fragments would have the same ID. And the fragment offset would tell us where they were in that collection of fragments. And so the flags would also tell us whether or not there were more fragments to, to come. So the idea is that you collect all the packets together that have the same ID, figure out where the fragment offset is, put them all back together in the same order. And again, in the next podcast, I'll show you an actual example of that. Okay, the time to live field describes how long a packet is allowed to exist on the collection of networks. So every router decrements this time to live field by one. When it gets to zero, the packet is no longer forwarded, or if a router is going to decrement it to zero. The protocol field tells us what is actually encapsulated in this particular IP datagram. So in our case, uh, we were encapsulating an ICMP packet, and so this code, 01, means ICMP. The checksum field is a checksum on the header. It's just an error check on the header alone, not the data itself. And then, of course, these are followed by the source and destination IP addresses, which is going to be our next big topic. Every node operating on the network has an IP address. Now, the IP address is 32 bits, or 4 bytes in length, and is organized into what we call a dotted quad notation, which is a set of four base 10 numbers uh, separated by those decimal points. Now, the base 10 numbers are just for us. They range from 0 to 255, and machines convert them to the binary numbers, as you've seen uh, at the bottom here. Now, every IP address has two parts to it. One is the network portion, and one is the host portion. Now these are actually determined by the network mask as we'll see here in a minute. Before we can talk about masks, we have to talk a little bit about classes. Now the original architecture for IP addressing on the internet was based on what we call classful addressing or these classes that you see here. Uh, hosts were assigned to a class A, B, or C network and these networks vary in size. Uh, with Class A networks being very, very large in terms of number of hosts and Class C networks being much, much smaller. But there are a lot more Class C networks than there are of Class A's. Uh, each class is also identified by a set of binary values in their starting octet, the first octet, and that's what you're seeing here as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the values that you see here in a moment. So here we have the net masks. Now each class has its own mask associated with it. And as we can see here, as an example, class A has a 255.0.0.0 mask associated with it. Now in order to determine the network portion and the host portion, what you do is you take an IP address and AND it with the mask for that particular IP address. And the result from that operation gives you the network ID for that particular host. So, another way to say that is that the ones, the binary ones, so if we converted the 255 to 8 ones, those ones would indicate the network portion. And the zeros, the 000 converted binary would be 24 zeros, would give us the host portion. And as you can see, in the class A's, 
we've got one byte of addressing available for networks and three bytes of addressing available for hosts. And the opposite is true for class C's, for example. If you're a little worried about the whole masking set of operations, don't panic. I'll be doing more podcasts on that later on. And there's a chapter in the book, and I've already done a webcast out on O'Reilly that describes how this works. There's a lot of information on this particular slide, but if you break it down a little bit, it's not that hard to get through. We have our classes of address, and we have the number of bits in what we call the prefix and the suffix. The prefix just describes the network portion, and the suffix uh, describes the host portion. Each class is broken up into the number of networks and then the number of hosts in each one of those networks. So again, a class B, for example, there are 16,000 about uh, possible class B networks and in each class B you can have 65,000 hosts. It's a lot of hosts. Um, in addition, down below there I've put a little graphic in there that shows you the base 10 numbers in the starting octet for each network type. So for example, class A's will always begin in the range of 0 to 127, and class B's 128 to 191, and so on. Now, just as a little warning here, there are a lot of other addresses that are reserved. So for example, we don't actually use the values 0 or 127 for class A's. Uh, but more on that a little bit later. This slide here shows some of the special IP addresses that I alluded to earlier. Now it's broken up into prefix and suffix, and remember that those are determined by the mask. So um, if we have all zeros in the prefix and all zeros in the suffix, that's a special address. Now what this also means is that these are binary values. So if you take your 32-bit IP address and convert the prefix portion, the portion described by, in our examples, the 255s, and make those all zeros and then make the suffix all zeros, you get an IP address that when converted back to base 10 is 0.0.0.0. .0, .0. And that is only seen during DHCP processes or what we call bootstrap. If you have the network ID, again in binary, but if we converted it, an example here at RIT, it's 129.21, and then in the host portion, 00, zero uh, that would be the identification for the network. And so you just work your way down through, and these are some of the special addresses. Now, I'll just make the distinction here between the directed broadcast and the limited broadcast. A directed broadcast is a broadcast at a particular network, and a limited broadcast is a broadcast on this particular network, that is whatever network you're sitting on. Now, they're used in very similar fashion, but there is a distinction there. Any address that begins with a 127 is going to be what we call a loopbacker for testing. Now from this, we can see that there are a number of addresses that you can't assign to any one particular network. And that's why I said earlier that even though the range of IP addresses allowed in binary for class A's might be 0 to 127, we can see here clearly that 0 can't be used and 127's can't be used. It turns out that there are other IP addresses that we don't allocate to public networks either, for example, those used in association with network address translation, such as the 10Net, the 192, and the 172. And there are even more. So if you said to yourself, wait, where do we use these addresses? Well, here's your example. Uh, what this is, is the host routing table from a node that was sitting on the network. Now you can pull your own host routing table using the route print command for a Windows host, and you'll see similar output. Now each one of the addresses that we discussed earlier is represented here along with the host address and a special address that begins with 169. Now that's not a Microsoft thing, it's actually an IETF standard zero config address uh, and it's used for ad hoc networking. Now we'll talk about the processing of this routing table in a later podcast. Earlier I said that class full addressing is really a traditional approach to assigning address space. Today, ISPs actually control large chunks of address space by manipulating the masks, and no one organization will get a class A or a class B network assigned to them anymore. Now, it turns out that we actually organize IP addresses on a global level, and these organizations listed on this particular slide are responsible for a particular region. Now, each one of them has their own website, so you can go out there and read some of the documentation, 
see how all this stuff is managed, and then see some of the issues that come up as a result of managing such large address space on it. Well, thanks for listening to this networking podcast. There will be more to follow. I hope you found the information useful. If you get a chance, pick up a copy of the Packet Guide to Core Network Protocols and let me know what you think. And as always, feel free to visit us at www.nssa.rit.edu. Thanks again, and may your packets always reach their destinations.